now This MMA what we talking about Yeah, you tuned into the pod now Gonna be hard for you to stop now Yeah, we caged in Welcome back to another episode of Caged In. I'm your host, Krista Carlo. Today, we got a very special guest making her debut on the show. It's Anna Crutchfield. How are we doing today, Anna? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. I know you got a big fight coming up April 21st, you know, on that Fury FC 89 card where you're taking on Kara Greenwell. Before we touch on that one, though, I'd like to get your background a little bit, get to know you a little bit better. Um, So let's start at the top. You know, where were you born and raised and what was growing up like for you? So I was actually, I was born in Frankfort, Indiana, but I moved to South Carolina at like age seven. So pretty, I grew up basically in South Carolina and um, I started boxing at age 12 there in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. I had an extensive boxing background um, from age 12 to 19, really. And then at about 15, 16, I kind of ventured into the kickboxing world as well. So very much a striker. And then... Um, in 2021, beginning of 2021, I moved to Birmingham, Alabama, and that's really where my MMA career kind of kicked off. I'd had some, I'd had two MMA fights prior move, prior to moving to Birmingham, but um, didn't really train MMA. I just was a kickboxer that jumped into the cage. So my MMA career really started around 2021. Nice. And then what was your introduction to the sport of MMA and, you know, what sparked the idea in your brain for like, this is something that you want to pursue and, you know, ultimately make a career out of someday? So at first, like I said, I grew up in a boxing gym and Mm -hmm. uh, back in those days, uh, boxers definitely looked at MMA a little bit differently. Uh, MMA wasn't what it is today. I feel like the sport has progressed so much since then. So starting off, I was like, oh, wow, that's like, I'm never going to do that. I thought MMA was for like people that weren't good at any one thing. They were just like mediocre at everything. So um, I was like, yeah, I'll never do MMA. And then I started training at Upstate Karate in Simpsonville, South Carolina. Um, That's where Stephen Thompson trained out of. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my first introduction to the MMA world and what that was. And um, I got into the kickboxing a little bit and I loved that. I was super successful in kickboxing. So um, eventually it came time. They were like, do you want to take an MMA fight? And I was like, yeah, why not? Let's try it. Uh, (laughs) Did not work out well for me. Uh, My first two MMA fights, I really didn't have much wrestling or grappling experience at all. So uh, the first fight, my amateur debut, I was submitted in the second round. My second fight, I was held up against the cage for nine minutes. So I was like, I hate MMA. (laughs) I hate it. I'm just going to kickbox. And then... I got to the age where I was kind of like, okay, I really need to decide if I'm going to try to make a real career out of this. Cause I was working at like a fitness kickboxing gym and gyms like that, just so I could train. But I was at that point where I wasn't really going to make much money in kickboxing and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So then I met my boyfriend, Ethan, and he is, he was an MMA fighter. He trained here in Birmingham. So he was like, Hey, come to the gym and let's just try it. So I started coming to Birmingham on the weekends and like cross training. And that's when I was like, whoa, okay, this is actually kind of fun. Now that I know a little bit about wrestling and I'm not dying every time I do it, this is kind of fun. So I took a couple of amateur fights again and I was successful and I ended up just falling in love with it. And that's when I decided we're going to go at this full force. So that's where we've been doing it since. I've been working at the gym since 2021 and training full time in MMA. Hell yeah, that's awesome. Let's talk about your nickname a little bit. I know you go by Bandana. Uh, Where did the nickname come from? What's the origin story behind that? So when I started boxing, um, in USA Boxing, you can't have any hair showing out of your headgear. So like even Mm -hmm. if I braided my hair or whatever, it couldn't be sticking out of the headgear at all. So we would braid my hair and I'd put it up and then we'd put a bandana on top of it. So uh, I made like a little highlight reel of all my boxing stuff once I had moved here to Birmingham and I posted on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And my whole team ran with it. They were like, oh, Bandana Anna. (laughs) And they were like, we need to bring Bandana back. So um, that was kind of, that's my alter ego, I guess. They call me like Thug Anna, Bandana Anna. I get into my mode, my boxing mode. Got my Bandana on. So it just kind of stuck. There you go. It is catchy. And, you know, it matches with your first name, too. So just Bandana Anna rolls right off the tongue. I think it's a good one. Yeah. 
definitely does. For those that haven't seen you fight before and those that are going to be tuning in, you know, on Fight Pass to watch the Fury FC card, how would you describe your fight style to them? Um, I'm very aggressive. Uh, I throw lots of volume and I'm in your face the whole time. So uh, I'm not, if you listen uh, to any of the commentary and in my fights, especially like my pro fights, you hear the commentators being like, well, Crutchfield's starting at a crazy pace. I don't know if she can keep this pace for 15 minutes, but I do. I have very good cardio and that's, that's my game plan is to be in your face the whole time. I'll be there, there until you put me out or I put you out. There you go. That's awesome. Let's get into your fight history a little bit. Um, you know, you finished your amateur career three and three. Um, the fight that I want to touch on a little bit is one in new up here in new England. You came to cage Titans 51, made the trip all the way up here, um, up to Plymouth and you played spoiler by beating a home crowd favorite. And a lot of the people that I talk to in new England, since I am rooted here and half off for cage Titans, they always speak about, you know, the cage Titans experience. So I was curious from your point of view, you know, as being someone out of state or the away team, you might say, what was your experience like fighting up here in new England for cage Titans? It was amazing. Um, so my best friend, uh, Arthur and Popo, he was from Massachusetts and very well known in cage Titans. So from the mm-hmm. second, he moved here. He actually moved to Birmingham the same week that I moved from South Carolina. Oh, so nice. um, whenever he came here, he was immediately talking about Cage Titans. And the whole time he was like, I got to take you back home. You got to fight for them. They're the best promotion. He all the time was hyping up Cage Titans. So I was very much excited to come and fight for you guys. But obviously I knew I was coming into uh, some enemy territory, I guess, if you will. Right. But it was also cool because like I said, Arthur was from there, and he's also SPG. He was from SPG East Coast before he moved to Birmingham. So I kind of had, like, my SPG family there, my extended family, even though I'd never met them. As soon as I came, we went to Steve uh, Steve's gym, and they were all super welcoming. And then even in the crowd, like, I was walking out, and I had people stopping me, and they had SPG shirts on, and they're like, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and then um, after the fight, everyone was just – super welcoming and super loving and supportive. So it was an amazing experience. And then I got a friend out of that. Aaron and I still talk and I root her on. So it was really cool. That's awesome. I know that was also like a little fun fact. That was the first card that I've ever covered live for Cage Titans as well. So it is cool that I got to see you fight in person. And now here we are, you're in your pro career. And, you know, we're finally doing the podcast and, and chopping it up a little bit. So it's pretty full circle. That is cool. Let's talk about, you know, your amateur title that you claimed over at SEFC. Um, It was the last fight before you turned pro. So I was curious, was that something that was kind of on the checklist for you as like a something that you wanted to do before you could officially, you know, turn your pro card and become pro? Um, I mean, obviously fighting for titles is something that every amateur wants. Um, But really, I turned pro because I was unable to get fights anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. I had four or five fights back to back to back that the opponents pulled out, like throughout my entire MMA career, even before I moved to uh, Alabama, like I just had a really hard time keeping opponents. Um, So when it got to the point where they just couldn't match me anymore, we're like, all right, well, I think my game is well rounded out now. Um, Before, obviously, I wasn't at the point where I could go pro. But then I felt like my game had rounded out my wrestling and my jujitsu was where it needed to be. And then so we decided to make that decision and jump to pro. There you go. You are currently two and one as a pro. Um, You lost your pro debut to Cheyenne Bowers. You know, looking back on that one, um, what do you think you learned most about in that fight and from that loss? And then what do you think you've grown the most from looking at your game now to how you were in your pro debut? Yeah, I mean, that was that was tough. I mean. I had dreamed about being a professional since I was 12 years old. Obviously, mm-hmm. I thought I would be a professional fighter at 18. I thought I was going to go pro in boxing, and go to the Olympics and be pro. And obviously, life happened, and that's not how it turned out. But I did put a lot of pressure on that moment because it's what I dreamed about my whole life, just my, my pro debut, my pro debut. And it was here in Birmingham in front of my entire team. I had my nieces and nephews, they've never seen me fight. They all flew in to see me. Uh, so it was a big moment for me. And then I faced an incredible fighter in Cheyenne, um, and I lost. I was submitted. Not only did I lo- lose, I was submitted. So after that, it was absolutely devastating for me. Like that night, 
I remember after the fight, whenever the I just got submitted, she stood up, the ref came up to me and I was just kind of sitting there in a daze and he was like, are you okay? And I just looked at him like, what the heck do you mean am I? No, I'm not okay. And right. he was like, physically, are you okay? And I sat there for a second and I was like, yeah. And I don't even like, I honestly don't even remember the decision or anything. I just, I have a picture of it, of her standing up and she's screaming and I'm sitting there just like, what the heck just happened? Um, so after that night, it was a hard pill for me to swallow, um, definitely. But after I picked myself up and I was done moping about it, then I feel like I definitely took a lot away from like the mental aspect of it. Like there was lots of things that went wrong in that camp, um, but no matter what, it's the fight game. So I can't blame it on that. Like it's me just every day trying to get better and better. So I put that loss behind me. I decided I was moving down. I was trying to move down and wait before just because I didn't really cut any weight to go to 125. I walked around 130 right. ish. Um, so after that fight, I was like, I'm definitely going to move down because I felt like she was so much stronger than me in those clinch exchanges. Um, mm -hmm. During the first round, like I dropped her with two right hands. Like I was, I was giving it all I had and she was still there. And then every time she popped up, she was so strong. Um, that I was like, all right, I need to move down in weight. And then since I've moved down in weight, I feel like my game has just completely changed. Like I feel like I've, I've been the dominant fighter, both of my, um, since my pro debut, my second fight ended up being a 15 minute grappling exchange, basically where I got the best of everything. And then my next fight, it was the same way. I was tearing her up on the feet. I was able to score all the takedowns. I stuffed every takedown. I was in dominant positions every time we hit the ground. So I definitely feel like it helped me a lot having that experience, like facing someone like Cheyenne, who is a very good grappler. Um, I feel like it definitely gave me the confidence. So like now I'm fighting girls smaller and I know that I can deal with that pressure. Right. And you are, you know, currently on a two fight winning streak. And do you think the change in weight class has been a big help in this current run that you're on? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think I learned a lot from that fight. There was, there's was, there been two fights in the, my career that I feel like have just been game changers to me. I lost them both, but I needed both of those. Um, one of those, it was against Carly Judice, um, and we had a 15-minute striking war. It was, in a, it was an amateur fight, but it was uh, five rounds, and we just stood in the middle of the cage, and we went at it for 15 minutes. And she was a very high level striker. She was amazing. I'm going to be rooting her on forever. But I learned so much from that fight. And then after that, facing a grappler like Cheyenne, that just gave me confidence knowing that, like, I've faced these amazing strikers. I've faced these amazing grapplers. Like, I know I can deal with this and I know I can go 15 minutes. Definitely. So it's, no, definitely, it's been beneficial for sure. Definitely. And, you know, they do say that, like, from each fight and each experience, you do take a little bit away from, from each of those fights. So the fact that you are fighting people that are powerful in different disciplines definitely is going to, you know, add to your toolbox as well and make you a sharper fighter as a, as a full mixed martial artist in the long run. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about your training camp a little bit. I know you are in the middle of camp, you know, a couple of weeks away from fight night. Um, what's a typical fight camp look like for you? Where are you training at? And, you know, who are some of your training partners you're getting the most work in with? So typically I like to have at least an eight week camp. Um, this one was short notice. I took it on about three weeks, but mm -hmm. I am coming. I fought at the end of February. I fought 15 minutes. So I was already in shape. I just, I've been in camp since the beginning of the year, basically. So this was a little bit modified of a short camp, a uh, shorter camp, but um, I have amazing training partners here. I have, um, there's only two girls on my team. One's a little bit heavier than me. One's a little bit lighter. Um, so I get good looks there, but I also, I'm on a team full of small guys, uh, 125ers, right. 135ers, black belt, brown belt level. So I have the the perfect camp around me. I train under Chris Conley. Um, I'm managed by Eric Anders. So I feel like I have the, my dream team around me right now. I have the perfect coach. He is, I don't, you were at the fights, so yeah. you kind of know how he is in the corner. Um, right. He's. He's great. He gives you very like detailed, like, take your left hand, put it on her right arm. Like I know that no matter what, like they, they've got my back and I trust them fully. And then same thing with my training partners. They're, they're in here every day. We train two to three times a day 
and everyone trains two to three times a day. So I don't have right. to worry about, oh, who's going to be here to train with me this session? Like I have a very dedicated team behind me. There you go. That's awesome. And also very important to have, to have a, a consistent fight team, people that are all, all competing for, you know, a similar goal. Um, that's definitely important to have. And I'm glad that you have that as well down there in Alabama. Yeah, for sure. Let's get into this one then. Fury FC 89. You are going in there versus Carver Green, Greenrail, who was one and one. Fight goes down April 21st. Um, since this was short notice, you know, it is at a catch weight of 120. What originally happened to the original fight for Carr, if you know of uh, what happened there? And then, you know, how far in advance did you get the call for this one? Yeah, um, I know she was supposed to face Carson, uh, Carson Nash. Um, I believe she's out of Colorado. I don't know what happened there. Maybe she was sick or injury. I'm not sure, but for some reason she pulled out. And then whenever my manager came to me, he didn't even tell me like who it was for or anything like that. He just goes, he be 115 by April 21st. And I just looked at him and I was like, I mean, probably <laughs> not. Why? And he just walked away. And I was like, whoa, excuse me, yeah. come back. I was like, right. why? Like, who is it for? And he was like, Fury. And I was like, Okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can make it by then. And he he told me the opponent. And Karen and I have followed each other on social media for a while, um, so I know of her. I know she's very talented. So whenever I took the fight, I knew it would be a tough fight, but it's also it's the break I need. It's for a big promotion. It's on UFC Fight Pass. They offered me a four fight contract, so I have nice. a consistent roster of females after this. So mm -hmm. I knew it was an opportunity that we had to jump on. Um, so they ended up, they since it was short notice, they agreed to take the fight at 120, which I was thankful for. So I don't have to make the weight cut all the way down to 15. So that's mm -hmm. a huge relief off your sh shoulders, of course. But um, it's been it's been the perfect camp, what camp, I guess, so far. So I'm excited to go out there and put on a show. Right. You know, that is cool that they gave you a, a multi-fight deal, even as like a late replacement. I don't feel like you see that much, even in regional MMA, you don't really get to see contracts like that very much. So that is pretty cool of them to do that. And I feel like it is one of the bigger pools as far as regional MMA go. It's definitely one of the bigger ones for sure. Um, so it is cool that now you have your foot in that door there. And like you said, a constant pool of fighters for you to be fighting against. Because yeah, that's always been the biggest thing is just like finding females. Like they're we're obviously newer to the sport. Females MMA is not as big as the males. So the pool's not as deep. So I was always trying to like, well, who could I fight next? Who could I fight next? And then now I have a consistent roster. So that is amazing. Definitely. And even like, I know they're rooted in Texas, so they have a big pool of fighters in Texas as a whole, but they also have a big pool of fighters from all over the country that fly in, you know, just to fight for Fury as well. So it does seem like you're going to have no problem finding fights there and especially against top competition as well. Exactly. Exactly. And it's on UFC Fight Pass with lots of eyes on it. So yep. I'm hoping I don't have to fight out the full four fights before I get the call. But if so, I have a full fight, four fight contract in front of me. There you go. And let's talk about your opponent a little bit. I know you mentioned that you are familiar with her. Um, what do you know about her? And then how do you feel about her game? Um, I think she's super talented. She's very well-rounded. Um, she's likes to keep it on the feet from what I see. Uh, she's very much kind of like the Western Muay Thai style, I would say. Um, she will wrestle, but she doesn't ever really, I think, never really seen her shoot a lot, but she'll wrestle you back once she's wrestled. So I think it's going to be fun. I'm going to go out there and kind of see how the fight plays out. But I feel like I have the advantage everywhere we go. There you go. And you did mention that, you know, this fight is on UFC Fight Pass. You will be fighting in front of a big crowd over there in Houston, Texas, but also a bigger crowd tuning in on UFC Fight Pass. Are you excited about the idea of having, you know, a fight like this in front of a bigger audience than, than usual? Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, it's not something that you want to focus on too much going into the fight. Like, no matter what, if I'm fighting in Birmingham, Alabama in front of 200 people or if I'm fighting on UFC Fight Pass in front of millions of people, my goal is going to be the same thing regardless, right? But it is definitely a little bit cooler, a nice production behind you, the lights, the cameras. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be cool. For sure. And Fury cards are typically on Sundays. I know this one is on a Sunday. Um does it throw you off at all fighting on a Sunday? Because most cards are, you know, Saturdays, typically some Friday nights. Because uh, I know even as a viewer, like tuning into MMA, it is a little different watching MMA on a Sunday. So as a fighter, does your preparation change at all, knowing that it is kind of like a day different? Does that matter to you at all? Um, 
not really. It is different being on a Sunday, um, but not really. Only thing it changes is when I start my water load and when I start the cut. But right. other than that, no. And then I get to take the next day off of work because I got to travel. So it makes it a little exactly. bit better. Exactly. <laughs> Even better, even better. Uh, what yeah. can what can the fans in attendance in Texas and you know the many that are tuning in on UFC Fight Pass expect from Bandana Anna once the cage doors lock on Sunday, April twenty first? You can expect me to come across the cage and be right in her face from bell to bell, and I, I expect it to be a striking war, honestly. So we'll be throwing hands. Awesome. I'll be tuned in. I know many people will as well. This is a, honestly a really good Fury UFC card as well. The, the entire card's pretty stacked. And, you know, now knowing that you're going to be on the card as well, someone that I had seen it fight in person, now I get to see them fight on UFC Fight Pass is pretty cool. So, uh, you know, best of luck to you uh, in the fight. And any last words that you want to say before I get you out of here? Um, just first of all, thank you for having me on here. I hope we get to chat again. And then, of course, thank you to my entire team here in SBG Alabama. Shout out to my SBG East Coast family in Massachusetts, my people at Cage Titans. Uh, appreciate all you guys. And then I look forward to putting on a show for you guys. Awesome. All right, Anna, thank you very much for taking the time. Best of luck. And uh, we'll, we'll be tuned in to watch you on UFC Fight Pass for sure. Yeah, thank you. Got down for the count and he can't even talk now. This MMA, what we talking about? Yeah, you tuned into the pod now. Gonna be hard for you to stop now. Yeah, we caged in. Yeah, we caged in. Yeah, we caged in.